son of famous parents, head of Quincy Jones Entertainment, radio and TV news executive, friend of Nelson Mandela, and director of Washington programs for USC's initiative on election cybersecurity. Now you might ask, how does one man handle all of that? Let's find out. Adam Clayton Powell III, thank you for being on the uh, Black News Channel. Thank you so much. Uh, let me ask you about the USC Election Cyber Security Project. What happened? Uh, we just went through a big election. What did you plan to do leading up to that election? Well, since 2015, we've been working on internet uh, security and cybersecurity issues. And uh, certainly after the 2016 election, it was clear that elections and campaigns were going to be affected by uh, cybersecurity and by bad actors, foreign and domestic, trying to disrupt our elections. Uh, last year, in election year 2020, we actually did uh, workshops for election and campaign workers in each of the 50 states. We did 51 workshops. We did California twice. And uh, it was a team that was put together with schools of communication, engineering, public policy, uh, law, uh, who am I leaving out, um, business. And we had, uh, because of the pandemic, we had to switch to doing virtual uh, video workshops uh, by the middle of March. And uh, that let us uh, bring in hundreds of state elected and appointed officials as uh, presenters and panelists. We had media partners across the country. We had university partners across the country. And um, we reached 4,000 people across uh, 50 states to help people uh, defend themselves against um, uh, cyber attacks and, uh, and against disinformation. Tell me about Mitt Romney. He was part of one of your workshops. Well, we would have uh, presentations on uh, cyber safety and cybersecurity for campaign and election officials. So what you need to do if you are a candidate, what you need to do if you're working in a campaign, what you need to do if you are a state or local election official, because everybody uh, was vulnerable. And in fact, the uh, head of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee said, before you announce you are a candidate, you'd better have your security in place because you're going to be attacked from day one, from hour one, from minute one. And uh, uh, people are going to be trying to uh, raid your emails, trying to disrupt your campaign. And what we saw over the course of 2020 was more than anything else, people were trying to actually reduce confidence in democracy itself, trying to get us to question how our elections work and how secure they were. Adam, let me ask you a question. How did you get involved with USC? Uh, I got involved uh, with USC because uh, back in 2001, shortly after 9-11, uh, a couple of people who I had known uh, for years, uh, one was the dean of the uh, USC Annenberg School for Communication, uh, who I'd known since we were kids in New York, and the other was uh, uh, the person who was about to become the dean the uh, School of Engineering, they approached me and said they would like to uh, offer me the joint appointment in both communications and engineering. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool, you know, communications and engineering. And they said it was the first time ever. And I said, oh, first time at USC, well, you've got two good schools, one of communication, one engineering. And they said, no, we think it's the first time in the United States. And uh, I, I couldn't resist because it gave me the opportunity to uh, do research and teach at the intersection of uh, content and technology. And little did I know that just a few years later, I would actually be directing a National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center at USC, um, which uh, was, uh, we had a great slogan, we were going to create for the user an experience indistinguishable from reality. Hmm. I like that, I like that. Adam, let's go back to the days of yesteryear. You are the son of uh, famous people, Congressman uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the first black congressman from New York, a big 
deal because my mom is from New York. He was a big deal at our house. And your mom, Hazel Scott, star of Sage and Screen and famous pianist. Let me ask you this. When did you first realize they were special? When did I know they were a little different? Well, I remember the night I was allowed to stay up late to uh, watch the news. This would have been 1954, so I was uh, eight years old. And um, uh, NBC in New York had a um, 11 o'clock anchor who was one of these old fashioned uh, stylized guys. And he, he would always begin his uh, program by saying, what kind of a day has it been? It's been a day that President Eisenhower told the communists he would not really, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Everybody used to make fun of him. Uh, but uh, this night, uh, they allowed me to stay up because I knew my father had been away and he was home again. And uh, so at 11 o'clock, they began, what kind of a day has it been? It's been a day that Adam Clayton Powell returned to Washington, D.C. to a hero's welcome. Whoa. Nice. <laughs> he was the beginning of the newscast. And it was uh, the day that he had returned from Indonesia from the uh, Conference of Non-Aligned Nations where uh, Eisenhower and the State Department had tried to uh, persuade him not to go. Uh, instead, he uh, got press credentials um, uh, and reported, he did he filed reports for the black press, but he also uh, surprised everybody in uh, Indonesia at the conference by uh, uh, saying, yes, the United States has a race problem, um, but we're working on it. In Russia and China and other communist countries, they're not working on it. And they also have race problems. We've got to take a break to pay some bills. More with Adam Clayton Powell III when we come back on All Things Men. Welcome back to All Things Men. We're talking with Adam Clayton Powell III. We have so much to talk about. Nelson Mandela, CBS News, and more. Let's dive right in. A lot of people don't know that your mother was the first African-American host of a TV show way back in 1950. That's before Nat Cole, that's before Oprah, before anyone. What was that like? Oh, well, she was uh, still just mom to me, except I knew that she came on TV at 7.45 uh, in, the, in the evening. And uh, occasionally uh, I would be able to uh, go down and uh, go to the studio with her in Midtown Manhattan and uh, watch her do her show. Now, what I didn't realize until very recently uh, when uh, a book uh, came out about uh, her show and about a few other shows that were on in the early 50s is that some people say that my mother actually invented the television variety show that uh, the things that were uh, done for that program and things that were invented for that program became standard for people who came later, Perry Como, uh, 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 Matt Cole, and, and others who had uh, the variety shows in the, uh, in the 50s. Uh, for example, her show was the first show where the director was able to shoot the piano keyboard diagonally instead of horizontally. <laughs> now, now we can do that electronically very easily. But at the time, it meant they had to take a pedestal camera, those big, heavy pedestal cameras, and tilt it to get that shot. Um, and um, funny PS to this, my mother was a, a played herself on uh, the ABC soap opera, All My Children. And um, uh, she uh, was doing one of the shows, and one of the camera operators came over and said, you probably don't remember me. I did your old TV show in 1950, 20, this was in 1970. I did your old TV show 20 years ago. And you know how heavy those cameras were that we had to tilt? <laughs> Adam, we're both brothers in that we both worked at CBS. Tell me, how did that happen for you? Well, in my freshman year as an undergraduate, um, I had uh, complained about uh, the news on a radio station. I, I'd never done this before, but uh, um, uh, I'd heard a newscast where they said that uh, Black Nationalist leader Malcolm the would no longer accept. I think, who's Malcolm the Tenth? Malcolm the Tenth. Malcolm the Tenth. And I realized, oh my goodness, it's, he's talking about Malcolm X. He probably hit that uh, that script cold and didn't uh, have time to catch himself. 
So I said, I've never done this before, but I'm going to actually go down to the Boston phone book and uh, look up the phone number of that radio station and complain. And it turned out that when I went to the phone book, the radio station was right on Memorial Drive. It was right on the MIT campus. It was the MIT radio station. And I went down and uh, knocked on the door and I said, your jazz is terrible and your news is worse. <laughs> Are you a student here? I said, yes. Yeah. Come in. And uh, by the time uh, they finished uh, with a PR sales job, I had agreed to do the 6 p.m. Tuesday night news sponsored by Muriel Cigars. But I really had no journalism in my background. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I knew what I wanted it to sound like. And so I called a uh, friend of uh, my parents who was a, uh, uh, had been out of work for years, who was a well-known journalist, but even out of work for years. Uh, I called him at home in New York and I said, look, um, can uh, uh, I buy you coffee or something and you can help me uh, learn this uh, journalism thing and so I don't embarrass myself. And he said, sure, the next time uh, you're down in New York on vacation, uh, give me a call. And, but I should tell you, uh, uh, I get to work now at four in the morning. I have a job. I'm, a, a, I'm at uh, CBS News. I said, oh, great. Uh, and um, and uh, his name was Mike Wallace. Uh, and uh, in June, uh, at the end of the, my freshman year, I uh, went down to uh, – uh, the or CBS News uh, was located then at, uh, on uh, uh, Madison Avenue, 44th Street, 43rd Street, and uh, excuse me, not, not Madison, it was at uh, uh, Lexington, and uh, went upstairs, and uh, I was literally just amazed watching what was going on, um, and uh, what happened was, it was just like in a, in a movie, I wound up um, being tapped as a summer intern because they needed somebody right away. What advice would you give to someone who wants to follow in your shoes? Um, be prepared to say yes when people ask you to do things that you're not certain that you know how to do. And I'll give you one short story on this. Uh, I was... Uh, Again, still a teenager at uh, CBS, uh, uh, intern at CBS News, and the president of the news division, Richard Salant, came through the news came through the newsroom, and he looked at me and he said, "You're the kid who goes to MIT." And I said, uh, "Yes, sir, Mr. Salant. You know about the space. You know about the space program." I said, "Well, I'm not an aero and astro major, but I know some about it, something about it. I know uh, some of the things that MIT does. It's good enough. Catch the next plane to Florida." Uh, Cronkite needs another writer. Uh, and so there I was as a 19-year-old writing for Walter Cronkite. I worked with uh, Cronkite um, from then on until um, the 1980 uh, elections um, when I was uh, manager of special events and political coverage for CBS News. And, uh, and then Walter stepped down. And uh, I left CBS uh, about a year after that. Do you have heroes of your own? There's one who I had the amazing fortune uh, uh, to get to know, Nelson Mandela, when he was released from prison he actually asked to see a handful of people from the United States. He asked them to come to South Africa to meet with him. Um, uh, of course, Randall Robinson, who had led a lot of the protests against apartheid in South Africa. Um, Arthur Ashe, um, Quincy Jones. I was an executive producer with Quincy Jones at the time, and I'm, uh, I called Quincy at the house, at his house, uh, it was a Tuesday night, I think. Um, and um, I said, I, I hear you, uh, you were at the doctors, you okay? And he said, oh yeah, I was just getting my shots. Do you have yours? And I said, for what? He said, for South Africa. I said, oh, oh when are we going? He said, Friday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, and um, we, I actually was uh, on the East Coast 
Uh, we met in London. Uh, he flew from LA to London. I flew to, from uh, the East Coast to London, and we got on a plane and flew down to uh, Johannesburg. And before we cleared customs, someone came up to us and said, Mr. Mandela will see you now. And Quincy said, oh, I've been in these clothes for two days. Uh, the British Airways has lost my bags. And oh, man, I, 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 Mr. Mandela will see you now. He, oh, OK, I heard that. Um, and uh, we were ushered into a car, which uh, drove to um, the uh, what was then the leading hotel in Johannesburg, the Carlton. We went up an escalator to the uh, mezzanine level. And there was Nelson Mandela. He got up and he said, oh, Mr. Quincy Jones. Oh, Mr. Clayton Powell, he'd heard that I was coming. He said, I'm, I'm so glad to see you. I knew your father. You knew my father? <laughs> Never came up in his autobiography. He said, oh, yes, yes, we met in London many, many years ago. Nice. Amazing. Um, <laughs> well, so that's when I met uh, Mandela. What we decided, uh, Quincy and I uh, uh, left a couple of days later. He did the Today Show, and then we went out to the airport and, and uh, flew back to the States. And as we were taking off from the airport in Johannesburg, Quincy was on the window. I was on the aisle. And he turned and he said, we've got to come back. And by the time we landed in London, it was, you've got to go back. And I wound up making uh, four trips a year to South Africa because Quincy had this singular idea, which apparently no one else did. At that time, it was illegal for American companies to do business in South Africa. And what Quincy quickly realized was, he said, someday it's gonna be legal for American companies to do business in South Africa. And when that happens, not a week later, not the next day, not that afternoon, the moment that happens, you, meaning me, he said, you are going to have contracts ready to sign with artists, performers, um, recording studios, um, television and radio, everything is gonna be ready to go. And so I made four trips a year to South Africa. Um, uh, and for some of the things I did, I had to have the approval, written approval, written support of the ruling national party, the apartheid government, and the African National Congress. Um, and uh, I was able to secure those letters of support, um, much to the surprise of a lot of people in Burbank. Um, and uh, in the course of that, uh, they got to know people at the ANC and, uh, um, and uh, Mandela. And when um, in 19, um, let me think, um, Clinton was president, had to be 1993, um, President Clinton invited Mandela to come to the White House to receive the Medal of Freedom. At that time, I was with a foundation, uh, the, the Freedom Forum, based in Arlington, Virginia. And I thought, well, if uh, Mandela is coming, I'll send him an invitation. He'll only say no, but I'll, I'll fax him an invitation. So I sent an invitation. He said yes. And so the morning that he was going to go to the White House, he agreed to come and do an event um, at our foundation and it would be covered on C-SPAN and CNN and so forth and so on. Um, and uh, I went over to his hotel to make certain that everything was okay, that he would leave on time. And somebody saw me in the lobby and said, oh, Mr. Clayton Powell, come up to the suite, come up to the suite. So I went up to the suite and there's Nelson Mandela in pajamas watching e ESPN Sports Center. Um, and uh, he said, oh, come here, sit next to me. Okay, he said, uh, perhaps you can help me with a problem. And I said, oh, certainly, whatever I can. He said, your Secretary of State, Mr. Uh, Warren Christopher, he has told me, um, Tabo, what did he say? He said, I should blow you off. <laughs> I know we have all these live cameras and a big crowd waiting for our event across the river. And I said, well, uh, um, uh, you are the uh, president of the African National Congress, um, and you'll be lead meeting later with the president of the United States. Um, the secretary of state of the United States is the protocol equivalent of your foreign minister. And Mandela's face lit up. He said, yes, Tabo, who was the um, 
foreign secretary of the ANC, he said, Tabo, you will go to meet Mr. Christopher. And uh, Mr. Powell, I will come with you. Well, Warren Christopher never forgave me. Adam Clayton Powell III, thank you for being on All Things Men, and thank you for being a guest on the Black News Channel. Uh, I, I could do forever with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. Maya Angelou was an American poet, author, professor, and civil rights activist. She marched alongside Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Maya received many prestigious awards and more than 50 honorary degrees. In 1993, she recited her poem on the pulse of mourning for the first inauguration of President Bill Clinton. On the side note, Maya was also a personal friend of mine, and my daughter is named Maya as well. Maya Angelou was born April 4th, 1928. She passed away on May 14th, 2014, at the age of 86. We miss you, Maya. That's it for this edition of All Things Men. As always, I'm your host, Mark McKeown. Till next time.